Good morning, my name is Andrew Krakow. I'm a doctoral candidate here at Annenberg, and I'm going to introduce uh, our first panel pretty briefly, I think. Um, so, Rudabe Pakravan is an architect with a decade of experience shaping the public realm. Uh, she designed the winning entry for the West End Pedes uh, Pedestrian Bridge Competition in Pittsburgh and was a finalist in Flip a Strip, um, a design competition to foster new visions for the renovation of old strip malls. Her work has been featured in magazines such as Wallpaper and Architectural Record. Um, currently, Pakravan leads her own design firm while also teaching architecture design at the University of California, Berkeley and the University of Southern California. We're actually welcoming Pakravan back to Penn where she received her master's in architecture in 2000. Next is Roxanne Varzi, an associate professor of anthropology and film and media studies at the University of California, Irvine. In 2000, while working on her doctorate, Varzi was actually awarded the first Fulbright for research in Iran since the Iranian Revolution. She has written a memoir recounting her time living in Iran, authored Warring Souls, which examines the lives of young urban Iranians in the context of a public sphere saturated with images of religious martyrdom, and has directed and produced Plastic Flowers Never Die, a documentary film that looks at the cultural aftermath of the Iran-Iraq War. And Tarana Meshkani, sorry, Tarana Meshkani has worked as an architect in Tehran in Toronto and is currently working toward her doctorate in design at Harvard. She has previously studied the spaces of nonviolent resistance in Iran and the city as a stage for embodied communication. Her current research examines how states define the boundaries between public and private spheres and the power of the multitude to translate between the two. Meshkani asks whether architecture can be mobilized to shape the public spheres produced by socio-political shifts. Welcome to, uh, to all our panelists, and I'll invite up uh, Rudabe. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you again to Monroe and Breyer for such a great program. Um, open this up. Do. Okay. Great. Okay. This works. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Observers of Iranian politics can be forgiven for ignoring this recent headline: police clamp down on satellite TV users. The crackdown on rogue television viewers have been reported periodically for the better part of two decades. Though they're usually overshadowed by news of international economic sanctions, rigged parliamentary elections, and the specter of war with Israel. Nevertheless, the satellite dish, or Mahvare, has been a fixture on Tehran's roofscape since the early 1990s, serving up American reality shows, Latin American telenovelas, domestic and international news, and dozens of other illegal alternatives to the ideological and religious conformity of the six state-controlled channels. The Iranian parliament banned satellite dishes in 1995 as part of an effort to limit the influence of Western culture, but enforcement has proved difficult. Despite door-to-door -door sweeps by security forces and electronic signal jamming, <clears throat> satellite use in the capital is at an all-time high. And although reliable statistics are hard to come by, a reported 40 to 65 percent of the capital's population has access to satellite television. Tehranis flout the ban, they pay the fine, secretly reinstall receivers, engage in all manner of camouflage and subterfuge, anything to keep the TV on. Until a few years ago, apartment dwellers would hide satellite receivers behind air conditioning units or laundry drying on the line. <clears throat> These days, the typical Tehran roof is so crowded that residents simply place dishes in the open and resign themselves uh, <clears throat> to periodically replacing those destroyed by police. Revolutionary guards who are denied entry to an apartment have been known to scale a building's walls with grappling hooks to dismantle receivers. It may seem like something out of a spy novel, but this cat and mouse game tells the deeper story of a complex exchange between the Islamic Republic and the citizens of Tehran. 
in the absence of legitimate public space for discourse or demonstration, the satellite receiver opens up a space for political dissent and cultural protest. To understand how the satellite functions as a substitute for the spatial tactics of assembly and protest, we must first understand how Tehran's public spaces have been strategically delegitimized. The space itself is there. <clears throat> Unlike in Cairo, where Hosni Mubarak systematically dismantled public spaces, <clears throat> including Tahrir Square, Tehran's recent mayors have added nearly 3,000 acres of parks, plazas, and green belts. The city now has 1,800 parks serving a population of 9 million, a ratio roughly comparable to New York City. <clears throat> but Tehran's inhabitants, as most of you know, are subject to strict behavioral laws which mandate harsh penalties and imprisonment for socializing with a person of the opposite gender, deviating from the Islamic dress code, or participating in any but the most benign group activities. <clears throat> Women are publicly humiliated, fined, and detained by police for showing hair beneath their headscarves, wearing makeup, or even having a fake suntan. Meanwhile, young men are targeted for wearing Western-style clothing or, long, or having long hairstyles, and both genders are prohibited from riding in the same car, speaking together in public, or gathering in larger groups. The severity of the sentence varies with the political atmosphere, but can include a fine, university expulsion, lashings, and up to 60 days of imprisonment. These laws have become even more restrictive since the student uprisings in 2009. <clears throat> Today, activities in all parks, streets, and other public spaces are tightly controlled and highly choreographed. Morality and vice squads, efficiently divided into the makeup unit, the relationship unit, and the hijab unit, arrive unannounced in police minivans at parks, shopping districts, and cafes popular with Tehran's youth. They round up offenders and take them to detention centers, often assaulting them verbally and physically. Shadowy officers on motorbikes accost groups of people talking or young couples walking alone on quiet streets. <clears throat> During crackdown periods, morality police appear weekly, sometimes daily, in the city's main public spaces, and it's not always clear which branch of Iran's com complex law enforcement structure they represent. Some are agents of the Ministry of the Interior, charged with enforcing the Quranic principle of amre bemaruf an nahyaz munkar, commanding the just and forbidding the wrong. Others are Islamic Revolutionary Guards or Special Operations Forces of the city police, or members of the even more extreme Basij, a volunteer national paramilitary unit notorious for violently suppressing demonstrations in 1999 and 2009. In addition to punishing moral offenders, <clears throat> The Basij Act is a neighborhood task force, organizing religious ceremonies and parades in local parks. <clears throat> Branches of the city government also participate in the choreography of public space. Tehran's municipal council has recently increased Basij street patrols under the guise of public safety. The mayor's office sponsors cultural programs, such as the Imam of Piety, which celebrates the life of Ayatollah Khomeini, with public exhibitions and events, and has ordered the construction of 400 mini-museums scattered throughout the city that recreates the homes of Islamic martyrs. In 2010, the city's Religious Activities Department announced that all parks would be required to host congressional, congregational prayers every Friday at noon, saying, the tradition of Friday prayers and muezzins reading verses from the holy book in loud voices has helped keep Satan away from our cities and villages we must now make sure that the same sound will be heard in all the capital's parks. <clears throat> the sounds of these mandated assemblies echo throughout the streets, bouncing off the hundreds of new minarets, mosques, and prayer halls the government has built in public spaces across the city. Tehran's municipal council approved 30 new minarets in lower income districts of Te South Tehran alone. In the greener, richer districts of the north side, mosque projects are fewer but more noticeable conspicuously placed across from secular venues like theaters and concert halls, reminding inhabitants of the regime's ubiquity. Information about the funding and construction of these projects is murky. Officially, the Municipal Council works with planners and architects to approve plans and construction companies hired by the city build the projects. But the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and other high government agencies can bypass this process and advance their own initiatives. Various organizations, nominally charitable foundations, actually fund much of the construction, bolstered by private donors who want to curry favor with the government. 
Only 12% of city dwellers go to the mosques by choice, and so these same groups work in parallel to fulfill attendance quotas by busing in rural civil servants to join true believers for Friday pra prayers, passion plays, and other state-sanctioned activities. <clears throat> Religious observances and events fill the park several times a month. This January alone, there were four public holidays devoted to mourning religious figures. And the rest of the time, they are used by groups that are usually left alone by the police. Families picnicking with children, older men playing backgammon, citizens praying or engaging in city-sponsored activities. Sometimes there are periods of several months when even young people are left alone, creating an illusion that the spaces are becoming more democratic. But then the, public, the political climate shifts slightly or summer arrives and the morality squads once again dominate the public realm. During particularly tense days, police cars line the edges of parks, watching over every move of the people. Predictably, this is jarring and creates a paranoid atmosphere even on calm days. As one student told me, even when you were just walking in the street with your friends, you have to look over your shoulder. What was okay last week may not be okay this week. Spaces of opportunity, for debate, leisure, discourse, spontaneous gathering, and protest must therefore emerge behind walls, underground, and more commonly in the home. Today, the home is the true public realm in Tehran, the private place where residents can socialize comfortably and freely, unmonitored by the otherwise pervasive government. Some even invite strangers into their homes, hosting events for charities and non-governmental organizations, and showing censored art in private galleries. Here, residents piece together the news of their city, gathering information from illegal media, mounting daily challenges to the regime's monopoly on information. Often the entire family gathers around a television in the center of the living room to catch up on Persian music videos filmed in Dubai or Los Angeles, <clears throat> um, watch dub soap set in Mexico City or Miami, and catch up on news from London's BBC Persian television or temporary channels set up by opposition movements. A particular favorite, <clears throat> is Parazit, a sat satirical news program in the style of The Daily Show, broadcast by Voice of America in Washington, DC. There is no more central character in this domestic narrative of cultural protest than the satellite man. The satellite man is typically young, with an entrepreneur's zeal and a sense of adventure, often from the mercantile district of South Tehran. Trained by colleagues in the black market niche of satellite TV installation, he begins by taking on overflow business developing contacts with dealers smuggling dishes via boat and truck from Dubai or Central Asia. He then creates a lo loyal customer base through word of mouth. He often works with gr within groups of friends and families driving around town to install the service for $150 or so and returning for occasional maintenance. His predecessor, the video man, first joined the ranks of door-to-door -door vendors in the 1980s, carrying a black briefcase with video cassettes, alcohol, music, and other black market goods, developing relationships with people in homes all over the city. The satellite man carries on the tradition, but in a much more dangerous zone. The vendor hawking romantic comedies is breaking the law, but the real threat to the regime is the man on the doorstep providing access to a 24-hour ch television channel beaming news from the opposition movement. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. And the regime takes the threat very seriously. It deploys signal disruptions, known as territorial jamming or downlink jamming, from, the noise station, from noise stations set up in small circular buildings throughout Tehran that host radio equipment operated by the Revolutionary Guards, or from mobile stations that drive around the city emitting microwaves. <clears throat> These stations scramble satellite feeds within a localized area, and the signal emerges as black and white static on the neighborhood screens. The government also deploys vertical or uplink jams, sending a signal up to the satellite itself, preventing it from receiving information from broadcasters. This tactic is used infrequently, as the entire satellite sig signal, which the government depends on to broadcast its own programming worldwide, will then be inoperable. And although the government admits to jamming foreign channels that it deems propaganda, permanently removing signal access is not an option, since regime supporters and government officials monitor the illegal channels. When a signal is jammed, broadcasting companies are then forced to rent frequencies from other satellites. This can happen quickly, but as household dishes are oriented toward the block satellite, the stations won't have the same coverage until everyone on the ground reorients their receivers. 
Signal jams occur without warning and can last for days, especially during periods of extreme political tension. They interrupt all kinds of programs, but especially news and analysis of events in Iran. It is during these disruptions that the satellite man makes his secret house calls, stopping in for a cup of tea and discussing the news or soap opera that was interrupted, then climbing up to the roof and repositioning the receiver to capture favorite channels from a new satellite. Although not overtly political, the satellite man, like many other young Iranians, is usually disillusioned with the, new, with the econo economic and political climate, and so discussion comes easily. Visiting up to eight homes a night, he becomes the purveyor not only of contraband television, but also of a lengthening chain of local news that links one house to the next. His customers' own voices are thus folded into the narrative. Penalties can be severe for installing and watching anything other than state television, so the satellite man and his customers are conspirators in a risky activity. Fines run from $500 for individuals to over $50,000 for dish importers. More worrisome is possible imprisonment and corporal punishment. With repeat visits every few months to reinstall or calibrate the dish or just add a few channels, the satellite man brokers relationships between citizens who wouldn't necessarily have access to one another in public life. In ambient television, visual culture and public space, the author Anna McCarthy argues that television reflects a media power structure that exerts control locally over its site, in the space of an airport or a bar, for instance, or in the home. In Tehran, the state television is site-specific, but its control is weak. Viewers use the satellite man to find the spatial loophole that allows them to thwart the signal jams. As households throughout the city tune into the same underground channels and as entire neighborhoods are subject to the same signal disruptions at the same time, television transcends the boundaries of the local site and is embedded as a series of nodes in the larger urban system, rendered visible by the network of satellite men moving from house to house, allowing communication to resume temporarily unhindered. One reason that the revolutionary movements um, were so big in 2011 in places like Egypt and Tunisia was the element of surprise. Governments underestimated citizens' anger and frustration with years of oppression and were ill-prepared to respond. In contrast, the Islamic Republic, itself born of violent revolution, anticipates exactly this type of group protest and reacts swiftly and violently. In June 2009, the immediate and brutal suppression of the Green Revolution crushed the nascent movement and set the sent the opposition further underground. In the years since, reformers' attempts to co-op public space have been met with state violence, arrests, and imprisonment. A group called the Mothers of Lale Park, led by women who lost their children in the 2009 uprising, organized a demonstration in the spring of 2011 that led to detentions condemned by international human rights advocates. More recently, morality police have arrested young people who were using Facebook and other social media to organize flash mobs and seemingly apolitical gatherings, including Bad Fashion Day, the meeting of the curly-haired, and an 800-person water gun fight. Iran's violation of the basic human rights of assembly and information access have long been condemned by the international community, most recently by the United Nations, in international in United Nations International Telecommunications Union, which declared that jamming is a fundamental violation not only of international regulations and norms, but of the rights of people everywhere to receive and impart information. Because legitimate public space is a critical element in any democracy, its absence can give rise to a more ambiguous set of spaces in which people exercise their rights. <coughs> Under these conditions, even a quotidian ritual like watching TV can be part of a broader spatial and political agenda. Years ago, the cultural critics Kristen Ross and Alice Kaplan observed that the political is hidden in the everyday, exactly where it is the most obvious, in the contradictions of lived experience, in the most banal and repetitive gestures of everyday life. It is in the midst of the utterly ordinary, in the space where the dominant relations of production are tirelessly and relentlessly reproduced, that we must look for utopian and political aspirations to crystallize. Tehrani satellite television culture doesn't guarantee a democratic future for Iran, nor does it substitute for public space, but it is a reminder of the various ways in which people find temporary places that allow them to remain connected, to gather spontaneously, and to create a sense of the public. We would do well to remember the debt that many democracies owe to such ambiguous spaces, places for people to gather their strength in preparation for change. Thank you.
Um, so with that, we'll uh, open it up to questions. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. My question is uh, from uh, Ms. Rudabin. Uh, you had a very great uh, presentation about the uh, signal jamming in Iran. Uh, so, uh, did you find out any any solutions uh, to over overcome the, this obstacles? <laughs> uh, not technically. I, I mean, I'm talking about the policy. For example, yesterday, United States uh, government announced that uh, they put IRIB uh, on their sanction list because of. Uh, Signal jamming because of violation of human rights, bringing people and torturing and bringing confession on TV uh, and so on. So, do you think it's appropriate uh, solution for, for pushing Iran to, you know, stop this kind of? That's a good question. I um, I'm actually not sure. I mean, I think the there has been an international condemnation of kind of signal jamming, not just with Iran, also with Syria and other countries. Um, and I'm not sure it's really been productive in the sense that anything has changed, um, which is why I, uh, although I don't think they should support the jamming, I think it's probably best to have a, a policy um, that's against it or to, to show that image. Um, but I do think that in places like Iran, it is these um, of unusual ways of subverting or thwarting those jams that can actually get any information to the public, right? So this idea of the satellite man, this idea of, of people um, constantly reinstalling the dishes because um, they no longer even choose to hide them. It's just this constant, you know, reinstallation, making sure your satellite is working, um, and and uh, repositioning it, I think that's the only way on a daily basis that you can you can maintain this sort of information um, coming to you. Um, so I don't know if a position by the U.S. actually makes a difference on a day-to-day -day basis, but maybe eventually. Uh, I have a question for Patty John and John. Um, you both mentioned satellite TV and how it has. Uh, more of a democratic potential, although it doesn't really constitute a public sphere. So my question was, um, if you know of the demographics or statistics about how many people have access and what class they might be in. Sure. Um, the, the statistics are very varied. So um, you have official um, IRIB, statistics which put it 25%. Nobody really has satellites, or not that many people. Whereas um, there have been some independent studies. Um, one was published by um, Golas Espandiari, who, who did a lot of research, um, that puts it closer to 65. Now certainly the upper classes would have probably be a larger chunk of that, but actually 65% of a city as huge as Tehran is a lot and will certainly encompass probably even a large percentage of the, of the middle and lower middle class. But again, that's a big statistic. I don't know if you have any more. Um, I have a question actually for all three of you because you are uh, have an Iranian background. So I was really fascinated by the images from uh, Tarani showing the difference between the public space and the private space. And when I traveled to Iran in 2003 with my students, we had exactly the same experience. I mean, on the one hand side, there was a really very strong constraint. There was a very strong constraint how to behave in public space, even if you are just a visitor coming to Iran. And then we had been invited by an architect to participate in a private celebration somewhere in the farmlands. And when we opened the door, I could not believe the difference between the private public space and the, pri the public public space. And I was really wondering how can this exist as a parallel world without this power of the, the private really penetrating the public or the regime. And we had this discussion, and the architect said, well, 
we are just trying to survive until the regime changes. But I was really fascinated by this social um, possibility. So maybe can you talk a little bit more about this? Because they really seemed like two parallel worlds that are very disconnected and they, they would influence each other if they would be more interconnected. I guess like sometimes they, they become more interconnected, but it depends on the political climate. And in times of hot there were like many um, spaces in between we like uh, emerged like coffee houses or the people go out and like even the guards didn't really care about people partying in private. Um, but again in times of Ahmed and Nijad, everything um, went everything back to pop private. Um, so I would say, yeah, it depends, like, when I was in Iran, which was like um, 2005, the last time, um, everything like, started to become worse. But we had, I, I would say, we had sometimes these um, mediation spaces um, that were in private public. Mm -hmm. Question is actually for all three of the panelists. Uh, um, that gave us this triad of uh, uh, analytic of regimes of law, regimes of norms of use, and regimes of property. And I thought all three of the papers did a really nice job of analyzing the really regimes of law versus norms of use. But I wondered if you could all, and there were hints of regimes of property, and I wondered if you could all talk a little bit more about how regimes of property, <laughs> I mean, Roxana uh, referred to uh, the fueling of construction by cheap Afghan labor and everything glimpses of it, but if you were to bring that more into the analytic, how would, how would the story change? I would say there are two laws in Iran. There are civic laws that are the same in Western countries, but there are also Islamic laws um, <laughs> that <laughs> work in different directions. So, um, and there are these Islamic laws basically private. Like, I mean, in Islam, everything, there's no private, right? So, um, I think there are those laws that are basically um, creating this situation. But, I mean, the property laws are like here, public spaces, public spaces. And civic law is the same, but those Islamic laws are. I'm just laughing, because the first time um, I went to Iran in 1991, I got pulled over by the comité for not having socks on and they went through my purse and they wanted to take away my prince tape and I got really bad <laughs> I said this is my private property give it back and they were just so shocked that I would even discuss private property when they were clearly going to take away my prince tape and um, it was just this moment where I realized that there really isn't any private property <laughs> when it comes to um, to being outside of the friends table. So, but that would be a whole other conference, I think, almost, especially when you get into all of the, the property laws. But I've been thinking about things like the kickbacks to construction companies right. that are building parks and kind of, um, you know, private investment in infrastructure and, in, you know, broader, and that's something that we're just glimpses of that in the parks. And I'm curious. It's also really, again, when you try to come in, um, legitimate research into, for example, I have actually spent a fair amount of time trying to do legitimate research into who funds uh, civic projects. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very unclear. For example, a lot of these Bonyad, these foundations, actually own many civic buildings or civic, they own civic property. Um, so it, it, the lines are so incredibly blurry. It's like the city of Tehran actually only owns certain things, but then these certain, these huge foundations own other things that are actually civic. And then the mosques and the minar minarets and, and the Islamic centers are on civic space, but they're funded. The construction is funded by private. So it's very and it's very murky. I mean, there's certainly no statistics. There's no you know. I've tried repeatedly to get stuff from the city of Tehran. It's very difficult. Um, they have a, maybe it's kind of like they have the civic law and the Islamic law. It's like, this is our civic mandate. And then it's superseded by the Islamic mandate. Right. There's also, I just should say, for 
also the question that came earlier there, there's some continuity from before the revolution, both in terms of private and public, um, spatially, right? So culturally, Iranians have always had Andaluni and Biruni, architecturally, the inside part of the house and the outside part of the house. So Iranians have always been culturally used to this idea of a public persona and a private persona. And then in terms of like private property, you don't even have to be a researcher, you just need to be an Iranian who's visiting family and just see how everyone is embroiled in some sort of court case <laughs> over <laughs> property dispute. And I found in the last trip that some of the stuff, even in my own family, happened before the revolution. Even during the Shah's time, Reza Shah came in and said, oh, you bought all of the land around Tehran? Well, guess what? That belongs to the government now. So that was, that was happening beforehand. So there's this continuity as well that's politically cultural and socially cultural. That's it's been there for a long time. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask Carolina if uh, after the protests there have been changes to the design of public space um, as by you know the government. As, as I were here, for example, after 9-11, public space design is now very different because of security and all this stuff. Has the Iranian government done a similar, um, has that, do they have a similar approach? That's a very good question. Um, I really don't know. I, I might be able to answer if you don't mind. No. And I don't know that much, but I do know that a lot of the construction projects, particularly of new mosques and Islamic centers within of park spaces, has happened since June of 2009. They're happening now. So there are like, there have been like 30, 50, 80, you know, projects just in the southern half of Tehran since June 2009 that are under construction or, you know, going to be shortly under construction that are religious to my public. So, I don't know if that helps. Um, this was just a question uh, for Roxanne and, and maybe rid of that. It wasn't clear to me when the last time you were in Iran, but one of the things that I noticed um, in the last few times that I was there was that you had at least a small presence of these uh, kind of semi-legal uh, book vendors on the streets, very similar to the kind of samizdat that you would see in Eastern Europe back in the day, mm -hmm. and which were kind of a mishmash of pre-revolutionary books. I saw a translation of the New Testament, um, Iranian authors who were banned, and I'm just wondering, Shariati, um, for mm -hmm. example, and I'm just wondering if any of that, that I hadn't seen that that had changed the last time I was there, which was 2010, and I'm wondering if, if you are still seeing that, you talked about the publication of books, and so I was wondering if, if there's been any shift in that. Um. I didn't see, I was there in, in the summer. I didn't see a lot of the vendors um, as much as before. But you can still, you can go to any Tehran University bookseller and ask them for something from the back room still, a lot of them. What I found interesting, and one of my next articles is going to be on the stuff that is published, that does have permission to be published, is kind of, um, surprising actually some especially i wrote about it in my book 10 years ago about the self-help movement right. and that's just that's even exploded further and it's and it's into the the christian authors i mean it's really interesting so i, I want to write about that next about the publishing um steve jobs memoirs like the biggest and the publishing house i was at they got it third so they're you know i think he only wrote one memoir but you know there are 10 different translations in tehran and they're all competing with each other but um in terms of those secondhand use books i didn't see them quite as much they're there though um, okay. this is really a follow-up on your question maybe i didn't understand the answer but has there um is there a kind of housemanization that is say after 2009 are these new constructions this ties to the national security question reorienting the streets are they securitized uh, are they housemanized in some way that's interesting i mean that's really interesting because it reminds me of your i mean your i love those diagrams by the way they're really beautiful um the this idea of the barricades and the size of the barricades and the amount of space um I don't know that answer officially, and I haven't gotten a sense. To me, it was more this idea of making, and again, it seems like it's actually toned down since two, between 2009 and now. Um, it seems like it's toned down since your trip, but it was this idea of making, making the presence of the regime known through these kind of more uh, religious 
uh, spaces that, that became present in the public realm. Uh, rather than changing up the streets, but maybe you, yeah. since you've been there. Well, one, one of the things that's happening is that there are a lot of government buildings, just um, institutionalized, not necessarily religious buildings going up, and they're digging very, very deep, <laughs> which has some people concerned about why they would need such deep basements. And so that's, that was just, that was a comment on the ground, was look at how deep they're going. And I thought, I, you know, after moving to California, I'm really scared of earthquakes all the time. And I'm not a major fault. <laughs> My first thought was, why are they building deep? Because I know that they're not doing a lot of seismic stuff. There's, there's an engineer who lives on my street at UCI, and he does a lot of earthquake engineering in Tehran, and <laughs> not very positive about that. But that was kind of one of those more sort of paranoid comments about bringing the prisons more into holding pens more into the city and um, and I did notice there were lots of construction sites especially when you have a three-year-old and they're not very well barricaded and they can drop we're talking like 10 stories deep <laughs> so that was that was just an observation I think that's because in Tehran if you live in Tehran or you can't go up. <laughs> um, no you need parkings for your cars and it's now happened underground even for residential buildings they do it now which is a huge problem for pollution because all that that stuff is going above ground, it's not ventilated well. I was a practicing architect in Tehran for a while. And if you go to the municipality to get the permit for building parking, for each unit, you should provide one parking space. And sometimes now in some regions, two parking space. So, and then you have limits for height, so you cannot go up, so you dig in. Yeah, we had pollution problems from our garage. And yeah, and if the questions piggyback on each other, then feel free to just go one right after the other. And if they're dissimilar, then we'll take them in turn. Well, I just have a question real quick. Um, uh, this is for all three. Um, I was looking at um, the diagrams that you show the organic, the kind of informal, more traditional type of roads. Oh. Um, the more traditional type, uh, type of roads, more organic roads uh, versus the streets, um, showing the sort of narrowly versus the new that is more gridded. There are the government or the new form of houseman construction uh, is, a, is creating, um, moving away from those traditional type of um, fabrication, more organic that exists in the old part of the, of the of Tehran versus to the new construction. and are they all those existing constructions or existing streets are going to remain um, are going to remain part of the being kind of controlled by the by the government? Why don't you ask uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I just thought that uh, all three uh, presentations kind of. Uh, describe uh, the nature of space uh, really as a contested ground that it's uh, it's in a, in a way we, we we are looking at the space uh, not like a maybe as a neutral kind of platform it's it's, it's very contested with with, the, with certain objectives and that applies with the money regimes of of a space but but I, but I have a one uh, like two specific questions and one for Roxana and, and one for uh, uh Ravon. uh like you, you talk about these shifts, and uh, I would like to maybe you can talk a little bit more about at what point or what makes these shifts possible. In other words, does that have anything to do with the nature of political personalities, like uh, the the change from Khatami to Ahmadinejad, or uh, that, uh, or, or 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 that shift from making it more Islamic into more open? And for uh, Pakravon, you talked about that these dishes were coming from Dubai and, and Central Asia. Like, like, where exactly Central Asia and, and what kind of people are in this? Uh, thanks. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, I think your question leads to the previous question, some major um, uh, like physical shifts happen after the green movement. I'm not sure about that, but I know that um, uh, Carlos Street was shown the mayor of Tehran, and he um, he was very efficient in uh, getting rid of uh, 
many parts, like many older um, kind of residential buildings mm -hmm. and uh, building now, but um, was like the um, uh, project. So he um, he he ba basically modernized um, Tehran, um, and um, his um, his actually impetus was to um, his impetus was modernization, not exactly for like uh, accepting new population to the city from rural areas, but not exactly like I don't know if it relates to the issues of control or surveillance. Um, and I don't know what's exactly happening right now with the new mayor, mayor but um, he was very, he was a very main figure in changing the many like old typologies in Tehran. I'll just add to that, that actually a lot of the original streetscape, not original, but the pre-revolutionary streetscape of Iran came from uh, the Shah's desire to, to hosmanize Tehran. All right, so Tehran has been hosmanized once before with like Bali, you know, Palavi and uh, what's now Ayvalov, and the, the axes were already cut um, and they were already there. And I would say one of the major changes in the cityscape has been less, from what I understand, changing of the roads and more getting rid of the individual plots of land that were generally larger estates mm -hmm. and hidden behind walls and creating high rises, which <clears throat> completely has a different, uh, especially in a, a city that has Islamic rules, a very, very different relationship between it. It's, relationship with the street and this idea of control of the street and then between apartments as well and privacy and public between apartments. I would say that's probably one of the most noticeable things about the changes of the Tehran cityscape. I think um, this this past summer what I really noticed is it's really it's about and, and you can add in as an architect but one of the things I noticed is it didn't seem like there are any zoning laws in terms of what's residential and what isn't and the other thing is I know that we like to constantly think about Tehran as this highly politicized space, but what's really happening too is a market economy. Um, Tehran is becoming very commercialized, and there's a lot of money in Iran. I think people tend to forget that Iran is a very wealthy country, and there's a lot of trade going on. Um, and my block, I was going to bring in a picture to show you of um, the street when my parents moved there when I was six months old. It was completely dirt, and our house was built, you know, they had it built. It was a three-story residential home, and now you can't even park on Gandhi, where I grew up, and um, there's a huge new um, insurance company that's being built there. So it's just, it's just driven out all the smaller, and people, what they do is when they get some money, they go and they buy these smaller residential houses, and they tear them down, and they build a sky. Right, and that's really not so much a political thing. That's a that's a market economy. That is, um, if you can build high, you can get people to um, to be part of the company, and you can buy the land, and then they'll develop it. And it's a, it's big business development. It's big business in Iran, and and um, I think just as an anthropologist, I'm yeah, I'm always looking at what's going on politically, socially, but also economically. I think the economy is really changing the landscape. And if you have anything to say about zoning or any of that. I think it's very true. I had this, this in 2000, the money that's pumped into the residential, uh, making the residential building, just not other things, but $17 billion in Iran at that time. That was huge money if you compared to the scale of economy of Iran. And yes, people in Iran, we had this system of economy that sell oil, the money get into the system, we do not really produce anything real estate and building and renewing residential building is the main part that that money consumed in the cycles and if you want to take part of that money you should get involved and that's why most of uh, physicians in Iran or plastic surgeons are building higher buildings. Real estate is the real estate is yeah. and then this is something we call the Karbosti effect mm -hmm. that he because the city could not get tax from people to, to go, you know clean the city make pedestrians everything he come up with this idea. You can violate the law as long as you pay back to the city. And there is something they call it Commission 100. It's the name of the commission. You violate the law, you go there, you pay your fines, and the city collect the fines. So that's why you do not have anything. You can build a residential building right to a, a government building right to a financial center. So it depends how much you deal with Commission 100. And that's, that's why. A little bit stricter. Yeah. Last year, but yeah. And one of the recent, really important recent change is 
because the, the, the housing development is totally privatized in Iran, never government been involved with it. But during Ahmadinejad, they start running a new huge project called Maskan mm -hmm. and it is in in, in reality they, the the government has started being involved heavily in, in residential building, and it's changed the pattern of the basically uh, finance in housing building. Uh, yeah, that's very true at Rizal, because in Iran, the only part of economy which is not in hand, private and the government has less than 90% involved. It's 90, about 90-93% yeah. of the residential building construction was private. But and it's changed, no? Yes, the Ahmadinejad get in, and it's yeah. most of them are constructed out of the cities. Yeah, because they try to make cheap housing and then kind of use it as a kind of propaganda, keeping the price of housing low. And that's why actually the, the, the Minister of Housing now is one of the candidates for presidency next term. Thanks. We're gonna we're gonna cut it off here and go have some coffee and come back at eleven. <coughs>